By 1986, the Sandinista revolution was in disarray. But the Contras were also in trouble. With reports of their human rights violations mounting, the US Congress banned the government from providing funds for the rebels, setting the stage for the biggest scandal of the Reagan administration, the Iran-Contra affair. Determined to continue their funding of the Contras, US officials sold arms to Iran in exchange for the release of US hostages and millions of dollars. This cash in turn was funneled to the 23,000 strong Contra army. Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, a member of the U.S. National Security Council, played a key role in establishing the covert network. And I don't like the insinuation that I'm up here having a convenient memory lapse like perhaps some others have had. I think that Oliver North was a true zealot. Um, he was a true believer. Uh, he thought they were in an historic apocalyptic struggle against the communist world and they had to fight to the death in Nicaragua. And these Democrats on Capitol Hill were all weak-kneed and soft on communism. And so he had to save the United States all by himself. I'm going to save any comments till the whole hearing is. President Reagan survived the scandal, claiming memory loss. I'm having some trouble uh, remembering that. We did not repeat, did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages, nor will we. My heart and my best intentions still tell me that's true, but the facts and the evidence tell me it is not. But the episode sounded the death knell for the Contras. And a decade of strife had also taken its toll on the Sandinistas. The Nicaraguan people were exhausted from war, economic turmoil, and confrontation with each other and the United States. It was against this backdrop that Ortega made good on his promise to compete in free elections. He was voted out in favor of a broad alliance led by Violeta Chamor. So the results of that election were unexpected. We wanted to win, we expected to win, and it was very hard to assimilate the results and for them to really sink in. But we didn't think twice about accepting the results. Gracious in defeat, the Sandinistas had proven even their fiercest critics wrong. The day which uh, the Sandinist Front recognized that we have lost the elections and that uh, Mrs. Chamorro had uh, win the election, it was a great day for democracy. In, in Nicaragua. It had been 10 years since the Sandinista Revolution, but as Daniel Ortega acknowledged defeat in the Plaza of the Revolution, he made a vow. We're used to fighting from the bottom. We're used to fighting our torturers, our jailers. And now that there is a revolutionary people's power in Nicaragua, we are better positioned to very soon return to govern this country from the top. But when the Sandinistas left office, they did not leave empty-handed. They changed the law and joined the landed gentry that they had spent so long opposing. They passed two laws to accelerate the legalization of property that had already been distributed. Much of it was fair, but these laws were used and manipulated to benefit a certain group. That was the basis for what is now the new Sandinista capital. Many were outraged by the laws that allowed many Sandinistas to enrich themselves while their countrymen were in ruins. But the new Chamorro government had more pressing matters to think about. The war was over, but Nicaragua was bankrupt and in tatters. The new government began the task of disarmament. The new U.S. President, George Bush Sr., even participated in this ceremony. The event marked the passing of a tragic era and ushered in a new beginning. 
Yet, Daniel Ortega knew that people still dreamed of the social justice his revolution had offered. And no sooner had he been voted out of power than he began planning his return. Today, Daniel Ortega represents the ambition for personal accumulation of power. Ortega started as a revolutionary leader, but has turned into a traditional populist. He remained head of the Sandinista party and became leader of the opposition bloc in Congress. He used his influence to negotiate shady deals with political enemies, even if it meant breaking with his closest comrades. His former vice president, novelist Sergio Ramirez, founded a breakaway party called the Sandinista Renovation Movement. I think uh, we split because I was on the side of uh, democratic procedures and Daniel believed that uh, we, we must uh, recuperate power at any price, at any price, even against the law, e even against the, the, the Constitution. And you, as a, as a founder of the Sandinista movement, found, find that apparently very repulsive. Of course, because the Sandinista Front was based in, 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 on principles, on ethical principles. By 1997, Ortega was using his power in Congress to strike deals with the right-wing ruling party. Each needed the other to form a majority in Congress that allowed them to reform the Constitution and share control of key institutions, the judiciary, the Comptroller General's office, and the Electoral Council. The right-wing president, Arnoldo Aleman, was widely denounced, even by Ortega, for widespread corruption reminiscent of an earlier era. The Somoza dictatorship had more than 40 years to accumulate wealth, but in less than six years, Aleman became a multi-millionaire. After leaving office, Aleman was tried and sentenced to 20 years in prison for swindling millions of dollars from the state coffers. Ortega used his influence in the courts to get him out of jail and later to have him acquitted at a price. In exchange, Ortega altered the electoral law, allowing him to win an election in the first round with just 35% of the vote, something unprecedented in Latin America. Only one thing was missing, the political support of former Contra Cardinal Obando y Bravo and through him, the crucial backing of the Catholic Church. But this backing was assured only when Ortega passed socially conservative legislation outlawing abortion. Although he had never expressed any interest in religion in the 1980s, Ortega asked the cardinal to renew his marriage vows with Rosario Murillo, his wife and campaign manager. For many, this was the confirmation that Ortega had sold out. The Cardinal was the spiritual leader of the Contras. Now it turns out that those of us who were with Ortega in the beginning are now the enemies. The oligarchs and the Cardinal and the Vice President, etc., are the great personalities of our national life. The vast majority of the original Sandinista leadership denounced Ortega as a traitor to their cause but not Eden Pastora, perhaps the ultimate pragmatist who returned to Ortega's camp. To take power, you have to make deals with Satan. Even if it means making a pact with the devil? With Mr. Satan, if that's what you have to do. It's worse to go to war, to kill people, but what is more moral, to make a deal or to kill? That's politics. It is justified if you use power correctly. Politics isn't clean. It's not made by angels or saints. Further evidence of Ortega's political transformation was provided by his choice of running mate for the 2006 presidential elections, former Contra leader Jaime Morales Carazo. The Sandinista leader had successfully secured the backing of former foes, whether Contras or Catholics, and he also gained the backing of the electorate, but barely, with little more than 37% of the vote, less than what he obtained in his three previous failed attempts at re-election. 